Welcome to No Password Required, a monthly conversation that gives you an up-close and personal look at the world of cybersecurity. Hello and welcome to No Password Required, a podcast dedicated to exploring the minds and personalities that make up the field of cybersecurity. I'm your host, Ernie Ferraresso, and with me as always is Jack Clavy. We also have Pablo Torres coming up with his segment, Positively Cyber. But before we go any further, let's talk about who we have on the show today. On the podcast, we're going to chat with Rachel Toback, the CEO and co-founder of Social Proof Security. Her company has an interesting mission. They would love to work themselves out of a job by teaching companies and individuals how to spot and shut down social engineering attacks by becoming politely paranoid. Well, speaking of politely paranoid, let's talk to a couple of folks that are uh, politely paranoid, namely the co-hosts, Jack Clabby and Pablo Torres. Jack, how are you, sir? Doing great today. Looking forward to talking to Rachel. She's from San Francisco. Uh, We record the podcast here in Tampa Bay, uh, the other Bay Area, as we like to call it. And so it's always good to get the two great bays connected uh, for things like this. Listen, for uh, somebody who grew up in the Northeast, you, you have to watch out about the, the other great bays because, you know, I, I, there is the other bay over in, uh, where is it, Wisconsin, Green Bay. That's so, right. That's right. Uh, the good people of the, of the Chesapeake Bay would also probably <laughs> take issue with that. Exactly. And then, of course, we look just over here. Well, we may be the bay, but we're also the Gulf. We're also the Gulf. <laughs> Well, I, I just ho- I just hope that when we finish recording the podcast, we can relax with a couple of uh, Coors Banquet beers, uh, Ernie. But as I, I think you probably read, as I read, that uh, there was some sort of an incident uh, at Molson Coors. There, you know, some intelligence is saying it was a ransomware incident, but beer production was uh, impacted or, or may yet be impacted by whatever's going on out there. I don't I don't like this. I got to tell I don't you, like where this is going. Um, you know, I said it before, and uh, it's 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 still. You know, Coors, Coors Light, the silver bullet, nothing can slow it down. Well, apparently, apparently something can slow it down. Um, yeah, and, and, and you think about it, this is another case where, uh, you know, where the, the ransomware, you know, the, the presumed ransomware ha- has impact in, the, I'll call it in the physical world. It's not just, you know, locking up their data or their, you know, when somebody's holding the data hostage, it's shutting down production. Um, and, right. you know, I can't imagine uh, uh, how much it costs, uh, you know, Molson Coors in time and, and, and money to have their production line shut down. So uh, let, al- let alone the fact that you, here we are, I guess, you know, hey, like we said, we thought 2020 was bad. Well, 2021, guess what? Uh, they're hacking and shutting down beer production. I mean, yeah. thank you, this universe. Is the, this is like a – it's like a, a, a modern-day uh, – version of the plot of Smokey and the Bandit, where they're in, I believe, the county in Georgia where Smokey and the Bandit was set. I think the plot of the movie, I've only seen it like 15 to 16 times, so I don't know if I'm going to get this right. But the the plot of the movie is they're in a dry county on that day, uh, and, and they need to get some, or they, they weren't selling cores west, east of the Rockies, or something like that. And then they have to go to Texarkana, Arkansas, to pick up a shipment of cores, and they only have you know a certain amount of hours to do it. Because, you know, so I wonder if there's going to be any sort of Smokey and the Bandit style stuff happening on America's highways as the supply. Dwindles. Listen, I hope there is. Um, I, 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 right. I hope that I'm not I'm not encouraging, you know, speeding or reckless driving. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that's where, you know, that that may be what what this whole genesis of is. is somebody's trying to, you know, they hearken back to the old days when when Coors was only available uh, uh, I guess it was west of the Rockies, and, and there, you know I think this might this so may, maybe instead of this being a, a hack, this is this is hacktivism. This is somebody trying to go back and say you know listen stick to what you know. I wonder if we could implicate the uh, the Yingling family here from Tampa and trying to you know the beer wars are they they're no joke. They're, you know it's it's serious business. <laughs> you know I I'm not going to start pointing fingers at where we should investigate. I, I'll, I'll leave that to the professionals, Ernie. But I will say, I will say this: you know, this is classic business, business interrupted. If it is a ransomware attack, right? It's a classic business interruption issue. I mean, we've been talking for the last year about extortionate ransomware, the ransomware 2.0, which was I take your data, I hold your data, and I will release it on the dark web to embarrass you unless you pay me a, a gajillion dollars. And this is. 
the old school version, which is we're going to shut you down, doctor's office or hospital. We're going to shut you down, bank, um, and not give you access to your files. And when shutting a company down means they literally can't produce the thing that they're contracted to produce, it has a cascading effect. I mean, if it's, it's one thing if like a, even a, an online retailer gets shut down by ransomware. You know, they're not selling product, okay, but they're not in breach of any contracts. Right? But if a supplier gets hit with a ransomware like this and they can't produce the thing that they're supposed to produce, everybody downstream who's buying from them can't sell and they've got all these contracts that are interrelated. So breaches like this, or, or let's call them security events like this, are very complicated to unwind from a legal uh, and contractual perspective, You know, particularly when you're making that very difficult decision within the company about, okay, we've taken everything offline. Uh, can, when can we start bringing systems back on? When can we plug back in the machine safely and know that what we're going to do is, uh, is going to produce you know, good good, clean beer for uh, red-blooded Americans to enjoy. Yeah, uh, and that's, I think you're, you're right, and I, I'd be interested, and I don't know the statistics, I mean, th- this is becoming more and more prevalent. I mean, we're going back to, uh, we want to talk to Not Petcha and the Maersk folks, that's where we're, you're, you're, you're having physical impacts. Uh, you know, the hospitals is another example, uh, when they, you know, they, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't process prescriptions anymore. So you're getting, we're starting to see this more and more and more, um, and and I think what something else that you could probably extrapolate is it's only you're only going to see it happening at bigger and faster because the uh, the sophistication required to conduct these things is becoming less required. Again, with the, I'll call it the democratization of these uh, attack tools, uh, crime as a service. Um, so I, I think it's I, I think it is. As sad as, uh, as, as this is, I think this is only, again, another example of we're going to see more and more of these, these physical disruptions. And I'm hoping that, you know, that because a Coors is a very popular beverage, certainly here in the United States, that this will be a, a, a clarion call for all of those Coors drinkers. And I, and I put the call out to you Coors drinkers all right now. Change your password, switch to multi-factor authentication, and write your uh, write your beer distributors to do the same. I don't, yeah, I, you know, it's it's an interesting one. But there have been you know in the reporting on the Molson Coors hack, there you know there were reports of other alcoholic beverage companies around the world that have been targeted. Uh, I don't know that reporting didn't indicate where the production lines were shut down. Right. Yeah. The special thing about this and what makes it something that we're talking about is it impacts production. You know, it's one thing to have a corporate headquarters hit. It's another thing to have, you know, a hit where even if it was done prophylactically, you actually have to shut down the production. And it's most in course now. So, I mean, those great some of those great Canadian beers could be impacted by this. Listen, Molson Golden well. is a fine brew, and uh, right. yeah, and and yeah. to take that one offline, I mean, you know, I I think there was a whole movie in the '80s that was uh, loosely based on that with Bob and Doug McKenzie. Um, you know, and back in see, which is even sadder because back in the day, you had to try to figure out how you could uh, uh, put a, a, a mouse into a bottle of beer to get free beer. Now, you know, now they're talking about electronically breaking into your, your networks to to shut down beer. I mean, what what a comment yeah. on society. I don't know what would make. I mean, I'm trying to think about something. Look, realistically speaking, this isn't going to do anything, as far as we can tell, with the worldwide supply of, of any of their products, but. Um, you know, it could it could do something in the short term, but I, I think though, what is a product that gets people this worked up? Like in the U.S., right? Like if if your cable goes out or nobody does cable anymore, I guess if your if your Wi-Fi and streaming service, if Netflix went yeah, out, yeah, right? What could be what could be better? I, there's a great um, we're going to be you know uh, one of the things that makes Rachel Tobak so interesting is that she has some training. Or, you know, she is uh, an improv comedian in addition to all of her other skills and. There's a there's a great skit that a bit that Patton Oswalt has and he you know he's a, a stand-up comedian but I think it's Patton Oswalt and he's on an airplane and the idea is like uh, there's Wi-Fi in the airplane and he's like this is this is amazing this Wi-Fi in the airplane like what a miracle and in, in you know in the year 2020 or whatever it was uh, I can have Wi-Fi in the airplane and he uses it for five minutes and then it goes out and suddenly he's like son of a gun. <laughs> The Wi-Fi in the airplane isn't working. This is crap. What is this? You know, the world is what is this, the eighties. It's like how, how upset he, you know, he's like, how upset could I be about this thing, which I thought was a miracle and didn't know existed five minutes ago. Now it doesn't work. 
we get so used to instant access and instant gratification so quickly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it was hard. And, and at least when, when the when the bars were shut down you know, for COVID for the last year, at least we could enjoy the banquet beer uh, on our own, yeah. in our own home. So, so hopefully that keeps the supply. Yeah, exactly. Keeps the supply so what going is, yeah. for us. What's, gonna, yeah. what's it going to take uh, for, the, for us to rise up? Well, I, well, I think I'd like to think that the, that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the hacking or the, uh, the, the hacking criminal underground finally took it too far. And they took on they took on Molson Coors <laughs> and their constituents, which, by the way, are well. I don't know. They're the Argentine right. Coors. But. <laughs> well, I'll tell you for our for our regional for our regional audience, we have heard nothing you know negative about the supply of Yingling or the supply of Cigar City. That's true, and I don't think Anheuser Busch has uh, from Busch Gardens, which is down the road. I think they're they're still up and running as well. So, <laughs> so uh, well, I, I wish the. The, uh, the Molson Coors people, all the best. We've got a really interesting uh, guest today. We're going to take a quick break. And when we return, uh, Rachel is going to talk to talk to us about her journey from imitating Harriet the Spy as a kid to becoming a cybersecurity expert and business owner. So stay with us. Have an idea for a guest or topic? Send an email to info at nopasswordpodcast.com. Welcome back. Our guest today is Rachel Toback, the CEO and co-founder of Social Proof Security, a San Francisco-based firm that teaches their clients methods to defend against attackers with engaging social engineering training, events, and testing. Welcome to No Password Required. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, yeah, you know, we're real excited to have you on, uh, on the podcast today. Um, you know, you've got such a, an interesting background and you're in such a I call it a crazy field. Um, just uh, it just sounds so cool and so interesting. Uh, you know how did how did you get here? Yeah, my path to infosec was extremely nonlinear. It started at the DEF CON Social Engineering Capture the Flag, the world's largest hacker conference, where they put you in a glass booth in front of an audience of five hundred people, and you have to hack a real life company target live in twenty minutes. I ended up winning second place three years in a row, and the rest is kind of history. I'm sure we'll get into that today. Yeah, so how, how did you even get to DEF CON? I mean, what, what's, what, what made you say, you know what, I want to go sit in this glass booth? Uh, I mean, most people are, are afraid of small spaces, but... Uh. <laughs> Me too. Uh, my husband, <laughs> my husband actually, he, he's in security. He's a security researcher. And uh, way before I even knew that the field existed, he was getting his master's degree. And he ended up going to DEF CON with a couple of buddies. And he asked me if I wanted to go. And I said, no, I don't think it's for me. I wasn't an InfoSec at the time. Um, and he was like, all right, that's fine. He got to Vegas. He saw the first day of the SECTF. He saw the people in the glass booths and he called me. And he was like, you have to get here. They're, they're hacking people over the phone. You don't need to know how to code. It's 100% for you. You know how you always call your Comcast and try and get the bill lowered. Like, this is the exact same thing. You're going to crush it. So I ended up going, and he was completely right. So you're telling me that you got your start in this by negotiating, by trying to <laughs> uh, lower your bills with Comcast. Yeah, that pretty sounds much. like to me that... Yeah, that sounds like you were using your, uh, your skills for evil and not good. Well, um, good for me. Probably they yeah, okay. <laughs> Rachel, is it something where like, you know, have you always been good at persuading and talking and getting your way into places like VIP sections in at concerts and restaurants and things like that? Does it translate to other stuff? I think it does translate. And yeah, I think if you ask my friends growing up, they would say, yeah, Rachel pretty much gets us into everything. Some of these stories I can't talk about, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. If you're looking for the kid who's going to get you to somewhere you're not supposed to be, I was definitely your person back then. So you're, you're at DEF CON and you have this success. How does it get from there to where you are today? It was pretty organic. People asked me, you know, they said, hey, I saw you in the glass booth last year or two years ago or this year. And I liked what you had to say and I liked what you did. I got to watch it live. I guess it's like a real life demonstration for people that potentially would want to hire you. And so they said, I would like for you to pen test my company. So they took a chance on me, and I ended up building my client base from there. It was very organic, which I, I really appreciated. Never had to do any sales or anything like that. I just was asked to pen test and, and ha hack their company over the phone or over email. Ended up doing it. They liked it. And then, you know, here we are many years later, and I have 50 clients that I work with every year. 
And did you, and Rachel, did you, from that point, did you start your own thing immediately or were you working with other places? How did it, how did the business side of it develop? Oh yeah. The first time that I got asked to pen test, I talked to my lawyer and she was like, well, you're going to need an LLC because <laughs> this is a little bit of a risky <laughs> business. <laughs> you don't want to do this just solo. So I LLC'd, uh, in 2017 and, um, you know, from there I just kept, you know, a lot of it was word of mouth really, which was interesting. I didn't know what to expect, but you know, people who I hacked, would talk to their friends and they would talk to their friends. And then from there, you know, I have more and more CISOs or CIOs who know about me and what I do. And it's kind of a niche, right? Like hacking over the phone, hacking people. Um, not everybody does that. Some people do, and there's quite a bit of us, but um, there's a lot of folks who do a lot more technical hacking and I focus more on the humans. And what do the flags look like for that? Right? Like if you're, if you're, if you're kind of hired to, to do a hack like this, what are your goals? I know it's going to depend on the company's who you're working with, but what would a typical sort of engagement look like for you? Yeah. Well, if you're talking about the DEF CON SECTF, you can actually look up those flags, but I'll tell you a few of them and then I'll get into what I do in my actual work. The SECTF flags are things like, do they have uh, in-house IT support or is it outsourced? Things like that. You're trying to figure out pieces of information that could compromise a company, but we're not compromising them in that moment, right? We're not going to actually say stuff to that audience that would lead them to actually get compromised. Um, But my, my uh, thing that I like to focus on in social engineering is account takeover. So a lot of times I'm being asked to go ahead and contact customer support, sales, whoever I need to, to take over an account and get that account in my name, whatever that name is, whoever I'm pretexting as. Um, and a lot of times I'll try and steal data, money, whatever I need to do. And it's super fun. It's cool because that's even more niche than social engineering in general. Account takeover is a very specific type of thing, and not everybody does that. But after the Twitter hack, when when I predicted that it was an account takeover attack using the admin panel, which is what I do in penetration testing, that's how I was able to predict it as the attack was happening, people were like, we didn't even know that this was a possibility. Can we talk to you? (laughs) So that that helped. So when you talk about the... You're taking over the account. How do you get people to do that? How do we prevent that type of stuff from happening? Yeah, account takeover is possible in many ways because of OSINT, open source intelligence. I can find out the information that's used to verify people over the phone by checking them out on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. So if you think about calling your service providers, let's say you're calling an airline and you want to change your flight. What questions do they ask you to confirm you are really Ernie, you know? And if you can figure out what those questions are, which oftentimes I can do in just one phone call, then now I know what pieces of information I need to get about their clients to spoof a phone number using my software, potentially change my voice using my software dynamically, and then answer the questions. Now, a lot of different companies are in the dark ages when it comes to phone call authentication, and I help them move towards using technical tools, things like MFA, multi-factor mm-hmm. authentication, so that they're not leveraging just human interaction in these things because I can do an attack that makes me seem exactly like the person that they think is calling when it's not really them. Is this something that you can train others sort of who are part of your team to do, or is this something that you, ha- that you have or you don't have? Oh, it's definitely something you can train. Um, I, I have a training that I do for red teams when they're learning how to do account takeovers as a part of their red teaming, because not everybody knows this skill. Not everybody's practiced it before. So it's definitely something you can train. I've trained hundreds of people to do it. My job, my whole goal is to work myself out of a job. I want it to be irrelevant that I can do an account takeover because it's not possible to do anymore. That's the goal. And people might think, oh yeah, she's just saying that because people say work myself out of a job. It's kind of a cliche, right? But I'm serious. I don't want people to be able to take over my accounts. That's a big deal. So I have a personal vested interest in this. I I don't want myself to be vulnerable through my service providers either. What do you look for, you know, for someone who's going to join your team, who's going to be part of a red team? You know, what kind of qualities are you looking for for someone who might be better than somebody else? Like, how do you weed out good people from people who don't have as much promise? I would say that the skills that you need to have in red teaming in general or penetration testing in general are um, a a real natural curiosity. You're really interested to dig deep. Um, You care a lot about people and you want to protect them. So you're not coming from a, a malicious standpoint. You're not interested in harming people or making them feel embarrassed. You're interested in supporting them. 
and seeing this as an educational opportunity. When people come from that point of view, they tend to over-index on kindness and, uh, and resourcefulness. And that's really what we're looking for. Rachel, I've seen you, um, I don't know if it was something I read that you said or something that I heard you say once, but it was about the distinction between criminals and hackers. And I think it's really important to talk about the distinction between the bad people and the hackers, because hackers, you know, that's a different term. Can you talk a little bit about that distinction? Sure. In our community, the hacker community, we think of hackers as helpers. So the hackers are the people who are helping you stay safe, doing the testing before the criminals get there first. The criminals do the same things that we do as hackers, but they don't have consent before they go ahead and do those things. We always have consent. We have a contract before we go ahead and hack you. The criminals don't care about stuff like that. They're looking to steal um, money, data, embarrassing details, and looking to use that against you. Versus a hacker, the people who are trying to help you, we're hired to do that, we're hired to help, and we have a contract and we have a scope in place to be able to support you and educate. So what's the, uh, your most favorite story uh, from on the job? It doesn't have to be, it, doesn't, it can be, you know, hey, I was walking and it turned out that I got the coolest rental car, or it could be, you know, actual on the job. What do you think? Well, I'm allowed to talk publicly about the fact that I was hired to hack the U.S. Air Force. Um, nice! They have, they have put that's, a blog post out about that, so I, I have I said, That's good, because I, I, I was in the Marines. I, you can hack the Air Force all day long. Love have fun it. at their expense. That's great. <laughs> I can't, I'm not allowed to talk about the specifics of that day, um, but uh, I'll leave it at that. But I will say it was super fun, massively challenging, extremely, extremely hard. Uh, took a lot of time, but a huge blast for me. And it's something that, you know, I've, I've never served my country per se in another way. So I thought it was kind of cool to be able to do that and make sure that the Air Force is as safe as they possibly can be. Uh, worst day on the job. <laughs> worst day on the job. Um, well, I don't often get caught uh, when I'm hacking over the phone, but I have had moments, and I'm very proud of my clients when they do this, where they will try and redirect me and really stay within their good protocols, and I really can't break through. So it's, it's interesting because my quote-unquote worst days on the job are actually the days that I hope that my clients have. So it's, it's an interesting double-edged sword, I think, because I'm really trying to fight them and, and get in there in, in a kind way. Um, but, it, but it's exciting and it, it makes me proud for them whenever they are successfully able to defend against me. I specifically really enjoy it after I've already pen-tested them once and trained them on what we found. And then the second time that I do it, maybe two quarters later, they successfully defend against me. So it feels harsh in the moment, but I know it's for a good reason. And it's very, it's very exciting. It seems very... Uh... Like you, 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 you're the coach. You, you got in there, and they've uh, they've updated their playbook, and they actually kind of know what they're doing now. And that's, yeah, it's got to be yeah, like a little little angry because uh, they've uh, you know it looks like the uh, what is it the, the student has become the teacher now, so to speak. It's like being the coach and the opposing team's quarterback, and I'm getting pummeled, but I train them to do it, so it's a good thing. Yeah, R- Rachel, we know that you've done you know some comedy, and, and you've been involved in different types of comedy, including improv, how does that contribute to what you do um, as in a profession, in a professional sense? Yeah, I used to perform improv on Friday and Sunday nights, and um, I really attribute a lot of my ability to hack live dynamically over the phone to performing improv. They are not dissimilar to one another. Um, when you're doing improv, you have to be able to think on your feet, You've probably heard of yes and, right? You're never trying to uh, be antagonistic to somebody, your partner, who you're trying to work with. Um, And all those skills are exactly what I use when I'm hacking. I'm helping, you know, in the scenarios that I'm doing over the phone, either I'm helping you when I'm hacking you or you're helping me. And those are very similar to improvisational situations. Uh, It's just a little different because a lot of times you can't laugh. So, um, you know, you can't break character, and, and that, that takes a lot of focus and a lot of preparation. So you are arguably one of the leaders in this field. You've come up kind of a, a non-traditional path to get into, the, certainly in the infosec space. We have this uh, diversity challenge in the cyber workforce. How do we as a cyber community uh, work on that? How can we do better a, as a community? Yeah, I like that you're asking this question. Um, representation is really important. When I went to the SECTF and I went to DEF CON for my first time many years ago, I questioned if I belonged. I didn't see a whole lot of people who looked or sounded like me. 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm under five foot. I'm a woman, right? I'm, I'm a small woman here. And I, I just felt like there weren't a lot of people that looked like me. And I felt like I was walking down the hallway like, am I going to get elbowed out of this? You know, are people going to believe that I'm a leader? And there are even moments where I'll be on a call and, you know, someone might say, well, you know, we'll, we'll wait until the CEO gets here to start the call. And it's funny because I'll be like, I am the CEO and let's get started. Um, and I think sometimes people are a little shocked, uh, especially when they meet me in person, you know, thinking, oh my gosh, who is this? This person looks young and uh, they're so short. <laughs> can they really be a CEO? Can they really be a leader? But, they, you know, you can be. And I think that representation is really essential. One of the things that I really care about is increasing that representation in cybersecurity and privacy. And I'm the chair of the board for the nonprofit Women in Security and Privacy, WISP, which works to advance women to lead in the fields. And I think a lot of times what we need is getting those underrepresented folks in positions of leadership. When you see someone who feels, looks, sounds like you in that position, you can imagine yourself there too. But can you imagine if you walked into DEF CON, Ernie, and nobody looked like you, they all look like me, right? That would be a little, you'd be like, do I belong here? Is this the right place for me? And that's why we need as many different types of people as possible, with as many different backgrounds as possible. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the, the areas that you know, we're striving to do, uh, it, it, again, is showcase that it's not, it's not the, uh, you know, the, the middle-aged guy wearing khakis and a polo uh, that's, that, that, that has to be in this field, or is it just people with hoodies over their head, you know, lean over the computer. It's, there is such a multiple paths into this field. Uh, you know, I, I read somewhere that, uh, you know, you drew your inspiration from when you were a kid. Uh, and one of your favorite movies uh, was Harriet the Spy. What's your favorite Harriet the Spy story? And have you actually done that in real life? Well, if you've ever seen Harriet the Spy or read the book, you know that what she's doing is OSINT, open source intelligence. She's observing people in the real world. Now, she doesn't have consent, and that's a big thing that I had to learn as a kid. Uh, you know, I, I, would, I used to go around trying to raise money. I would sell magazines door to door so that I could raise money to buy uh, spy tools. I wanted to buy a spy ear and listen in on people. So consent was a big thing for me to learn because Harriet the Spy didn't use any of that. She would creep on people, show up in their houses. I mean, you know, scary stuff. Um, but as a kid, I really found that interesting that she would observe people and take notes and learn from her observations over time. This was really important to me. I started keeping records of everything that would happen in my life. I have a notebook going back uh, from when I was five years old, when I was just learning to write my name, trying to spell things out, but I, ju I would just draw things out that I noticed. Um, and now looking back at those and thinking, man, that really was a young little OSINT kid trying her best to observe things and make connection, connections in the real world. And um, it kind of goes back to my path to security, too, that when I was growing up in the 90s, I, would, I wasn't particularly a whiz kid um, with technology. I, you know, I was on AIM, I was on Neopets, all the things that we did when we were younger, but um, I wasn't that fantastic at technology. It wasn't a big part of my um, schooling. And I wanted to take what was called infotech in school which is where you would learn some basic coding and you know, other cool things on the computer. And I went to my guidance counselor and I said, hey, I want to change my schedule. I want to go into Infotech. And she said, you know what, Rachel, I think you should go into home ec instead because you'll be in classes with boys only if you do that. You know, she thought she was protecting me. But really what she did is she, she stifled my ability. And I still don't know how to code to this day. Uh, and I, I don't want to say that it's anyone's fault because we lived in a different world. And I really think she was trying to help me at that time. She didn't want me to feel awkward. But that's the opposite of what I'm going for now. You know, saying to people, you know, you might, not, you might be the only one who looks like you, but hopefully we can lead uh, other people and people will start to think, you know, I belong too. And when we can find that representation in the world, in our leadership of cybersecurity and privacy, we can protect people better because we don't know what we don't know. So we need to get more diversity like underrepresented folks so that we can protect more people outside of our group with our code and with our policies. So I think if you could travel back in time uh, and as you walked out of that guidance counselor office and then current you was standing right there, is that what you would tell yourself? Just 
What would you tell yourself at that in that particular moment? Well, I've I've hinted to you how much I care about time travel. So we'd we'd first need to determine what the parameters and the rules are of this time travel. If we're talking <laughs> butterfly effect, yes! if we're talking butterfly effect, no, I would not go back and try and intervene because you don't know what's going to happen with the rest of the timeline, right? So is that let's just say, is that uh, Marvel Avengers Endgame or are we talking uh, Back to the Future and? Uh, the, the butterfly effect, I believe, is more uh, back to the future where if you mess things up, right, all of a sudden now you have some weird relationship with your mom. Like weird stuff and happens. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, and then you vanish from the picture. Yeah, we don't want that. So, um, yeah, you got to be real careful with time travel. I like a good Ashton Kutcher vehicle as much, but that movie, I went in with such expectations of it being entertaining and it just got so dark so quickly. So dark. Not a lot of replay value in that one. A lot of time travel is very dark. Ironically, my favorite show is called Dark. It's on Netflix. It's a German Netflix show, and it's a time travel show. It's basically like uh, Stranger Things if you punched up the horror like times five. Well, you got to hand it to the Germans, man. They do, they, they do take things to times five. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, I like it. What is it? J- just in terms, Rachel, in terms of how, how an engagement – they're like for a social engineering like works. If you're trying to, our law firm works with a lot of banks. And so, you know, there's corporate side of it. There's a branch you could reach, you know, there's a customer service. Like, I guess it depends on the flag, but how do you approach an engagement with a bank like that? Are you, are you trying to get into corporate? Do you want to talk to IT? What's like your um, order of acquisition? And so how do you go about it? It depends what the scope is for the project. Many financial institutions that I work with are particularly concerned about account takeover because that's how you steal the money. So if you're concerned about account takeover, you're probably going to attack the customer service portal or the folks who are manning the phones or emails uh, or chat. And a lot of times we'll start there and try and take over accounts of other clients that they work with um, and see if we can steal their money. Now, if they're more concerned about the corporate aspect, like, hey, we have some emails that are going out from HR, people don't know what to trust, they're concerned, they don't know what to do, that's a situation where we're going to want to start at corporate and maybe we'll move into account takeover later. But it really just depends on the scope and that I learned by listening to the team. Wow. And at, and at corporate, are you just calling like whoever's you can get the phone number for? I mean, do you, wow. Okay. Yeah. You can find a lot of that information via OSINT. Um, it's a little scary how much information is available about you online. I always recommend this. It's not sponsored content, but I recommend this product that I love. It's called Delete Me by Abine. Um, they will go through and delete your phone number, email address, address, birthday, all that horrible stuff that data brokerage sites like mylife.com or PQ, um, mm. they delete that for you quarterly, which I really appreciate because you can take the time to do it yourself, but it's so annoying and you have to fax things and I don't have a fax machine. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I just can't. We had to fax something the other day, you know, I, and, I, and I just recall that, you know, I can, uh, I can go online now and literally hear what is happening on Mars, on another planet, millions of miles away, but yet I have to fax something. I mean, that, anyway, that's... <laughs> it's, it's, it's just wild. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, like, some of these consumer-facing websites have these, you know, a little thing pops up and you can have a real-time chat with a representative. Do you, is that another vector that you use? Oh, yeah. Any opportunity to communicate with somebody who works there is a vector for social engineering. That includes um, individual people on LinkedIn uh, who work at that company. That includes text message, SMS, DMs that they might receive. Uh, any vector where you are communicating with another person is a potential vector for social engineering. It just depends what's in scope, though. Don't go, don't go around DMing people. You need to get consent. That's important. Understood. We, we probably have to wrap in a second, but I don't want to leave without sharing. What was the subject matter, you know, of one of those DEF CON sort of public hacks? What was, what was the flag you were going after? And if you remember, how did you, how did you accomplish your goal? Yeah. Um, so one of, the, one of the years I went after a knock agent on the phone. The reason why I, I targeted the knock agent is because I'm crazy. Uh, and also because the phone number was publicly available and 24 seven, it was required for them to pick up the phone, which is essential when you have a timed 
engagement. You oh, need them to God. pick up the phone. Yeah. And a lot of times it goes to voicemail. So I was like, okay, you know what? I'm a little, uh, a little out of my head right now, but I'm going to contact this knock agent. So I did. They picked up the phone, and I was able to convince the knock agent to go to a malicious URL. Now, a simulated malicious URL. I didn't actually take over their machine, but I got them to go to a malicious URL over the phone by convincing them that I was flying in to give a talk. And I name-dropped the right people in their organization, and they ended up going to that malicious link two times. So the name drop is what's important because that gives you credibility. Yeah. It's a social wow. proof. And a lot of times um, yeah. you need social proof to convince people that you really are who you say you are. Well, this is great. Thank you so much. After a short break, we're going to return with Ernie's Lifestyle Polygraph. And we're talking with Rachel Toback, the CEO and co-founder of Social Proof Security. Stay with us. You are listening to the No Password Required Podcast. We cover cybersecurity and a lot of other stuff. All right, so welcome back. Rachel, as you may or may not know, there is something in the national security community known as a lifestyle polygraph. A lifestyle polygraph is exactly what it sounds like. It is a polygraph assessment to determine your suitability for national security clearance. However, we've modified it slightly um, more as a way to to probe the inner workings of your mind and uh, get to a little bit, get to know you a little bit better, uh, because that's kind of one of our objectives here. Is what you know, you're you're a luminary in this field, and we want to know what makes you tick. So, with that said, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Question number one: As an expert dog person, as an expert dog person, which breed of dog would make the best cybersecurity professional? I got this one. This is easy. Uh, I would say a Shih Tzu. That's the type of dog that I have, so I know very well. He is patient, he's very observant, and he's a bit of a watchdog. Uh, And I think that that's what you need in cybersecurity. You need to be able to observe. You can't just overreact to every situation. But when the time comes and, say, your canary goes off or something, you need to be able to go into watchdog mode and investigate. All right. Interesting. Interesting. So all you Shih Tzu owners out there, watch out. They're going to be, you know, getting on the phone and, <laughs> and trying to take over your account. <laughs> okay, number two. Number two. What is more satisfying to watch? Stand-up or improv? Stand-up or improv? Uh, that's easy. Well, I've never performed stand-up. I actually don't. I think stand-up is very hard, much harder than improv. Um, improv, you go into it and you think to yourself... This is all made up on the spot, so if it doesn't work out, who cares, right? No one expects it to be 100% perfect. With stand-up, you go in thinking, they've practiced this for thousands of hours. If I'm not laughing, it's a problem, right? Uh, That's why I like improv more. I think it's uh, more casual, it's lower stakes, and it's more fun to watch because you just see people having fun. Um, So I would like to watch improv, and that's what I used to do in the before times. I used to go to see improv shows all the time. No, but that's a good point because sometimes you see ske- sketch comedians or improv comedians and, you know, they'll be put on a talk show or something where it's not necessarily, you know, it's not funny like go. And then you might see uh, good stand-up people who show up on Saturday Night Live and they're not that good. It's just different. I never thought of it as totally different skill sets, but totally. that, that makes good sense. Completely different skill sets. And I think that's something that people don't always realize is they're like, oh, that stand-up comedian so funny, so much funnier than that improv show that I watched. And I'm thinking to myself, they made up an improvised musical on the spot. <laughs> they didn't practice any of that. You're watching completely new information. It's like watching a movie that's being created before your eyes. It's very cool. I saw an improv show once where the, the lead-in idea was you're at the helm of a time machine that would have been a good lead-in for you, Rachel. Yeah, I, mean, I would be down. Anytime you want to do that improv, you just let me know. Okay, number three. Number three. If you were to interview Harriet the Spy as a potential new hire, which of her skills would you be most impressed with? Well, first I would talk about consent with her because she needs to know that. <laughs> uh, after that, I would say her resourcefulness, her ability to observe and listen. I also really like... I would also probably interview her about her ability to communicate using data to persuade. That's important. She was a great writer, 
and she takes a sense of ownership. She's very gritty, so she'll go out of her way to make sure that things turn out the way that they need to turn out. And the other thing that I like about Harriet the Spy is she over-indexes on kindness with others. If you've ever seen the movie, you know she has a best friend and her best friend has fallen on hard times and she goes out of her way to support that best friend. Um, and that's something that we really like to see because you'll find people who are attracted to social engineering for the wrong reasons. And it's because they enjoy being deceitful. They enjoy being sneaky. I hate lying. People get surprised about that all the time, but it hurts me. It's, I sweat. It makes me uncomfortable. Um, I don't like it. And sometimes people will say like, oh, do your friends or family have trouble trusting you? Because in your job, you're a social engineer. It's your job to trick people. And I would say, my friends and family know that it kills me to do that. It's something that I have to do to protect people and, ha and make sure I have the right educational points for them. But I over-index on truth and kindness because people have this mis you know, this, this perception about me that's, that's inaccurate. So I go out of my way to be truthful to the point where they're like, we get it, we get it. You don't need to provide any more data. <laughs> You're being truthful. <laughs> we get you. You're trustworthy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay, here's a tough one. If you could travel in time, if you could travel in time, and here's the, here it is, without any repercussions. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Without any repercussions, so no... You're not vanishing from any pictures, or you're not branching the timeline. Would you travel forward or backwards? Oh, I love this. Okay, so no repercussions, so no butterfly effect. No it's butterfly a, yeah, effect. Yeah, it's it's what it's like a Christmas Carol style. You would oh. you'd, be, you'd visit things, but not impact them. Oh, haunted by three ghosts. Yes. Okay. Backwards. Only thing I love more than time travel is ghost horror. So this is going to be great. Uh, I would go back in time for sure, because if you go into the future, you don't know what's going to be there, and you might end up in a post-apocalyptic society that really stinks. So I would go all the way back in time, and I would observe myself to learn from myself, you know, from myself as a child, and then as I went into adolescence, and so on and so forth. Um, and then I would use those pieces of data to build a better me when I come back to the present time. The future, I don't know anything about. I'm not stepping into that. But the past, I have a pretty good hold on. Well, I, could, I guess I can understand it. Nobody wants to parachute into a zombie apocalypse. No. Uh, you know, I, yeah. And what if when I get there, the repercussion thing changed because the you in the future changed that stipulation and now I can't go back? See, there you are. <laughs> there it is. We're caught in a time loop now. Exactly. This is it. Well, before we get too, too crazy down that one, here it is. The last one. I was afraid because I didn't want to get caught in the time loop. I, you know, who knew, I don't know if we're creating it now. I, I don't, I just, we are. We are. We, we are. Here it is. What is more exciting? What is more exciting? Finding a piece of data that you know that will make the social engineering hack successful or making the actual uh, phone call. This is easy. So have you ever gone on stage or done something and you're like, I completely blacked out. I have no idea what happened. I was just in the zone so much that I, I couldn't tell you what happened up there. That's what it's like when you're actually on the phone call dynamically hacking. You have to think so closely about what's going on and stay in the character that you're basically not even yourself. You're like outside of your body. I would not call that exciting. I would call that <laughs> a little disturbing. Um, so finding the gold mine of data to use is much more exciting than the call itself. Uh, the call itself is fun, it's energizing, it's, it's uh, terrifying. That's really what it is. Um, and sometimes when I'm performing improv on stage, I'll, I'll ask somebody, hey, did you record any of that? Because I couldn't tell you what happened. All I know is I was in the moment, I was yes-anding, and we were singing a song about time travel. That's all I got for you. <laughs> and as we, as we look to move on, from, the, from this, I, all I'm doing is I'm trying to think of a, a good time travel song, um, and I can't think of any. Are there, uh, that's, you know, that's, we, we talk about having different genres of things. I, speaking of songs, that reminds me, uh, as I'm, I may re recall somewhere that, Rachel, you created a sea shanty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have an InfoSec sea shanty, completely free. I mean, listen, let me just, let me just, can I hear that again? An infosec sea shanty. Yes. Like blow the man down, way hey. Yeah. I recommend that you insert it here.
There once was a kid whose passwords laid across all sites. They were the same, a criminal, then found their fame by taking that data to go. Soon may a criminal come to steal your pictures and data and run. One day when the crime is done, they'll steal your account and go. The kid then noticed strange behavior. There had been a login failure. Reused password was their traitor. It was already pwned. Soon may a criminal come to steal your pictures and data and run. One day when the crime is done, they'll steal your account and go. Now our friend did quickly learn their lesson. Don't reuse passwords. Turn on to step and store them in. A password manager encrypted wherever they go. Soon may a criminal come to steal your pictures and data and run. One day when the crime is done, they'll steal your account and go. Yes, I, I made an InfoSec sea shanty with the community, and it was so fun. I got to partner with different hackers in the community, and we worked together to harmonize, and I wrote the lyrics. It took me about an hour. Um, I have a background in musical improv. That's like a, the specific niche of improv that I focused on. So I can write songs on the fly. I just need other people to, to sing with me because uh, I'm not classically trained. So I can sing, you know, standard melody, but from there I'm not going to be able to harmonize. Um, and... It was a hit. It was really cool to see. People were like, oh my gosh, this is what I want my security awareness program to be. And I was like, go for it. And they used it and it worked. <laughs> they were like, people thought this was the most fun security awareness training they've ever had. So that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff I like to do. Use my skill sets that are a little wacky and out there and hopefully help, help protect people a little better. Rachel, we, were play, we played it last night uh, for a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old, and they were making up extra verses. So you got them inspired to talk about password security. I love that. Uh, it was a very cool, very cool thing to talk about what, what, uh, what dad does at work. So it was pretty neat. Thank you, for putting that, thank you for putting that out there. Of course. I've heard from parents. They've said, hey, I showed this to my kid, and I was trying to convince them to use multi-factor authentication on their Fortnite account, and they kept fighting me about it, and it was an extra step, and they were annoyed. I showed them your video on TikTok. And they love TikToks. So they instantly drew to it and they loved it. And now they have MFA on their Fortnite account. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel, how can people find you on social media if they want to on, on TikTok or if they want to uh, encounter you? No, I don't really use TikTok much, only for my InfoSec C shanty. But you can find me on Twitter at Rachel Toback, R-A-C-H-E-L-T-O-B-A-C. Anything else that you want to promote uh, on the show today or other things that we can, where we can find you or your company? You can check out my company at socialproofsecurity.com if you want to learn more about what I do and how to protect yourself. I have some videos on there and demos to show your family and friends. Uh, or you can just type in Rachel Toback on YouTube and cool stuff will pop up to maybe you want to talk to your great aunt about password security. That You can use some of those videos there. And actually, I'm going to do that because I do need to talk to my great aunt about password security, oddly enough. <laughs> That's great. Glad to help. So, Rachel, thank you very, very much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure, from uh, at least from my side of the table. Coming up next, Pablo Torres will share his take on The Mandalorian, a.k.a. Din Djarin, a bounty hunter that is so much more than a bounty hunter. This Take Charge leader knows how to broker a deal, form alliances, and complete tasks with precision and care. How does this talented warrior fit into our blossoming cybersecurity firm? Stick around to find out. There's a place for everyone in the world of cybersecurity, and Pablo Torres plans to prove it. Welcome to Positively Cyber. Welcome to Positively Cyber. I'm your host, Pablo Torres. Every cybersecurity organization shares a mutual need for leadership, talent, and talented leadership. So far, we have hired a mix of visionary leaders and keyboard-pounding digital defenders that form a foundation that our clients and we are all thrilled about. In every episode, we talk a little bit about how critical culture is in building a successful company. This is true for any company, but it's even more vital for a company like ours. Undoubtedly, we feel like the correct people are being hired. Is that the end of the story? Is there anything else we can do to ensure that the entire team understands the mission? Actually, yes. I think certainly we have found room for improvement and can most definitely add tremendous value by adding an obvious yet innovative piece. 
Right now, there is a missing link in our onboarding process. It's currently a two-step skip. We say, you're hired, and then they start defending. Easy enough. However, let us take it one step further. What if we propose creating a position for a person to introduce our company, our culture, and our expectations? Someone to be the first official point of contact that a new hire establishes. Someone to show our freshly recruited teammates the way. Based on our previous hires, there is a lot of obvious choices. However, are they the right choices? Hmm, let's find out. Dumbledore? Nah. He allows too much bad behavior, and in the business of mitigating risk, we are looking to add value by creating assets, not liabilities. And as for the guys who fight evil in the comic books? Yeah, good luck. They can't even get along with one another. No offense, Star-Lord and Rocket, we love you, just not in this role. Master Yoda, this is a hard one to swallow. However, no thanks. I'll pass. He makes terrible decisions in crucial moments, and I think Ahsoka Tana would strongly attest. Is there one person that could show us how, through their actions, that this is the way? I think so. There is one person for this job. I know who I want. I know who I want to set the tone for the moral efficacy that we will embody within our organization. Din Djarin, also known as Mando, the Mandalorian, who better than a battle-tested, trial-hardened veteran who survived amongst a group of fellow warriors after being attacked by the Empire, the Great Purge. We welcome you and your Mandalorian wisdom. When one chooses to walk the way of the Mandalorian, you are both hunter and prey. How can one be a coward if one chooses this way of life? In the very first episode of The Mandalorian, we see Mando. We don't know his name. We see him as a typical hero that is strong and seems to be very powerful. We may believe it is going to follow the typical masculine convention. And as we begin to discern, Mando embodies a very interesting leadership characteristic. His moral code is mostly seen in action rather than in speech. At first, he only seems to care about taking the task assigned by Gref Karga. Simple enough, simple stuff. A client gives a target, Gref Karga creates an opportunity, and the Mandalorian is engaged to capture and deliver said creature to receive pay. Easy day, right? Well, this is not the reason why we want Mando. Mando is cut out for the role because of the words that he does not say. Instead, he acts based on his intentions. When Din Djarin meets the child, aka Baby Yoda, aka Grogu, another side of the character emerges. We begin to see the development of the enmeshing feeling of care that Mando has for Baby Yoda. This will shift the tides and represent the true stoic leadership principles that Mando embodies as a hero who is committed to his mission of being a bounty hunter, or in this case, Baby Yoda's protector. As Mando's story progresses through the adventure after the adventure, it became apparent that he is a genius at building teams and getting all team members on the same page. His piece de resistance was getting a man with no friends, Boba Fett, to join him on an ongoing endeavor. To be fair, he did have Grogo's cuteness as an asset. We can work with that. I think an office basset hound would do the trick. Notwithstanding, Discipline is rooted in the truth that we tell ourselves. Mando's truth is that he refuses to allow galactic manipulation to impact his life. He intends to do something about it, and it all starts with keeping his emotions in check. From there, Mando can pivot and take positive healthy risks toward the goals and the mission critical objectives that he has taken on for his prophetically profound purpose. This level of decisive action is critical. Why? Allow me to differentiate. Leading and directing are synonymous, yet two different concepts nevertheless. The dichotomy I am referring to is the difference between short-term execution on value-added strategy through sound leadership and directing, which is contingent on the fundamental underlying value that makes strategic decisions sound. I think it is important that we make this distinction between the two and then choose the path to best follow. I say all of this because of what you do will produce who you are. With unwavering belief, Mando, you are the leader, and we look to you to show us and all of those who will walk through this doorway the way. Logic is greater than emotion, and the power that comes will be shared by us all. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Pablo Torres. All right, Pablo. So just a question about this. We're going to have... The Mandalorian be our what is his title? Again? He's the chief of onboarding. He's essentially talent management. Yeah, yeah. On spot our team. on, spot on, Jack. Um, 
He's, he's definitely the one who's going to set the tone for, for our team. Um, what does the Mandalorian embody as far as a corporate equivalent? Yeah, directly. Um, the director of HR or the chief operations officer. Either two would be appropriate for his fit. I have to tell you, I'm the, uh, I'm the hiring partner uh, for Carlton Fields, and I can tell you that onboarding is critical and finding the right people to act as sort of mentors and act as examples for new talent who joins our law firm is a really is, is a really important step because I think most people do think, okay, here's a new hire, put them right to work. You need to show people how we do things. Um, and you have a choice sometimes to pick charismatic folks who are always out there or people who do their job in a professional way. And, and I think the latter sometimes is more effective for onboarding and initial mentorship. There's this... I think in the cybersecurity community, cybersecurity community too, there's this idea that all leaders have to be super charismatic and out there and be mouthpieces. Uh, but, in, but in reality, probably the most effective uh, folks to lead onboarding are those who are just doing the job every day, not necessarily the most charismatic leader. So I like what you're doing here. I think it makes sense. I do think you need a glue, a glue guy, a glue person on the team. And I do think the, I think the Mandalorian could do that. So Jack, let me just say this. So are you suggesting that your secret life, you're a, a bounty hunter in the Star Wars universe? No, you know, honestly, my, my skill is in organizing and picking folks to do interviews and, and, and to help get talent in the door. I'm not great at onboarding. You know, I'm, I talk too much. I don't ask enough questions. So I think we really, you know, so I would not be good for that role, but I think what Pablo's describing is exactly the person you want. Uh, to have that sort of secret life, uh, not someone who's living in, uh, out there all the time. Although to be said, uh, I do have, uh, I do wear a mask a lot these days. So I've got that in common. I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, yeah. You, you know, and one of the things I was actually, I was thinking about this with what I really like about it is in the, the character of Mando, you know, he's, he's bound to the way, but he is not, I'd say bound to uh, it in such a way that he is not that he is not willing to change some of his actions based upon how things you know for pragmatic reasons. Meaning that you know he's not so bound to it that I, I can't take my helmet off and they can't see my face uh, to, to to end all be all. So he's not that fundamentalist when it comes to things. So I think having that that ability to understand the core. Um, where the core of your quote moral and ethical compass is, and then where you can, you know, okay, listen, yeah, the, the helmet thing, yeah, I, I, I get that, uh, but right now I think we can, we can move on beyond that. But uh, so that's one of the characteristics I, I think that also makes him a better, uh, a better, uh, a better person in this in this role is that it's like you know what you don't he can he can make these decisions on the, on on the end he's still true to his core beliefs, but he knows that some things are just more for. Uh, you know, not not necessarily for show, but not as that, that's not a true measure of who you are. Is is like okay if I if I hide my face because again if that's the case we're all in trouble when uh, COVID ends. We got to take our masks off. Uh, you know, are we all are we all going to have that <laughs> that type of problem? You know, this is not the way. I don't know. You know, I think the uh, his competence, his loyalty, make him a great person uh, to work with new hires on their initial set of projects. And he's also happy to let others shine, which is something yeah. that you really need in that initial onboarding and mentoring role. But I think what you point out, Ernie, is a good one. I mean, he evolves and changes. So his fanaticism, he, he, he learns and is open to learning that, you know, the, the, that aspect of Mandalorian culture that he was a part of may have been more to the extreme than even mm -hmm. general Mandalorian culture. And so uh, I think that you do want somebody who's going to be able to change, not somebody who's a 20-year uh, veteran with the company who does things, you know, in 2021 the same way they did them in 1991. So we've got a lot of great qualities with, uh, with the Mandalorian here that I think can help us as we think through how we're going to staff these cybersecurity organizations. Love it, Pablo. And the other thing, Pablo, I, you mentioned, uh, you know, bringing some cuteness into the organization. Um, and you know, baby Yoda aside, uh, a basset hound. Uh, I want to say that uh, Rachel mentioned that we should would, would bring in the 
the Shih Tzu, I think, was that what, uh, was that the dog we're supposed to bring in? Uh, I mean, I, you know, if we're going to take advice, we probably should, you know, go to, because I guess that's the cybersecurity dog, uh, the, the most professional cyber dog out there, which is that particular breed, I mean. Yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, taking it from a world-renowned leader like Rachel, um, if it helps for the social engineering tactics, yeah, let, let's definitely bring on a shit suit because we can go ahead and add some value to our firm. <laughs> Are we going to have to beep that out? Can we say know. that? I think we're okay. I think can we, we can say that? say that. If you say the full sentence. Are I we going to get, okay. <laughs> get an E on our podcast? I just, here's what I don't want to do. I, I, you don't want to say anything negative about the Bassett Hound That's people, true. though. Because they're organized. They're very on. They're extremely online. Uh, so they, they also have a place the, in the, the office. The Bassett Hound lobby is very powerful. Yes, I would, I, would, I would agree with that. And let us not forget that Bassett Hounds themselves are very loud. Uh, well, I think that brings us to an end uh, to this program, uh, this episode of, uh, of No Password Required. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. First and foremost, I have to thank uh, my co-hosts, Jack Clavy and Pablo Torres. Uh, and I'd also like to say a special thank you to our, our guest, Rachel Toback, um, who again uh, seems to be leading the way in bringing back the sea shanties, certainly bringing them into the world of cybersecurity. I'm Ernie Ferrasso. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the No Password Required podcast. The show is produced by Cyber Florida. A special thanks goes out to our friends at Carlton Fields and Cognizant. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast, visit our website, cyberflorida.org slash pod.